Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, where today I'm going to take a comment I found on the last Chaos Cultist video and turn it into an excuse to have a little bit of fun. Because somebody asked if I could do a full the logistics of a Chaos Uprising video, and I do love logistics, so why don't we have a little bit of fun today and brainstorm precisely how a Chaos Uprising would take place and what would be required to do so. Not in the generalized terms of the Chaos Cultist video where we talk about how it could happen, but rather specifically in an example, how would you lead a Chaos Uprising? So let's get right into it, beginning with one basic assumption. We are going to assume the cult in question is Chaos Undivided. We might evolve some other cults later on, but we're gonna go with Undivided because it gives us the broadest possible perspective, as there are of course many, many ways in which a Chaos Uprising could potentially be organized, as again I mentioned in the Chaos Cultist video. We are also going to assume the planet in question is a rather middle-of-the-road one. Not a hive city, or a forge world, or an agri world, but a little bit of everything. It might have one or two hive cities, the de facto capitals of the planet. It also has significant agricultural areas to support these cities, and it's got a little bit of industry splattered across the place as well. A more or less self-sufficient world. Again, this is to give us the broadest possible perspective as to a chaos uprising and how it would function. Because obviously, an uprising on a higher world would have to be organized quite differently than one on a forge world, or an agri world, or... <laughs> if you're being particularly optimistic about it, a shrine world. And finally, we are also going to assume our fresh-faced and bushy-tailed Chaos Cult is quite new to all of this insurrection nonsense. No cheating with friends on the other side, or Alpha Legion allies somewhere off in space. Just a gathering of like-minded companeros with a shared passion for arson and criminal insanity. So where does our merry band of misfits even begin? Possessed of nothing more than the irrational urge to see everything burn, they are a long way away from world domination, and, underwhelming oh, though it may sound, we'll likely have to start with getting a day job. <laughs> Basic finances. They tell you that a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, but I would disagree, as this idea usually neglects to mention the expenses involved in purchasing shoes, food, water, and everything else you're going to need on the way. The journey might start with a step, but the actual completion of one begins with a dollar bill and running an apocalyptic doomsday cult costs quite a bit of cash, I'll have you know. Especially before you have hordes of willing converts, happy and able to separate themselves from their life's savings. But we shan't go too into detail as to how our cult members began their rise to dominance by working at the 40k equivalent of McDonald's. Rather, the quickest and quote-unquote easiest way to get access to large quantities of money without spending 30 years building up a bank account would be by robbing somebody else's bank account, unsurprisingly. I'm sure it won't come as too much of a shock either to learn that most underhired areas are rife with crimes for, well, in part, this very reason. Rampant poverty and general depravity is another one, but hey, details, details. And many, if indeed not most, chaos cults begin as some form of criminal enterprise. It could be something like um, good old-fashioned burglary, general b &E, or something a hint more advanced like organizing war bands in the lower levels of a hive city to launch raids on enemy territories to steal, smash and grab whatever they can come across. Alternatively, there are several bands that operate outside the confines of hive cities too. 
Now, this is more of a middle-of-the-road planet, so in all due likelihood, this would be the most profitable and easy and relatively safe approach to take. Basically, becoming highway robbers, much like Games Workshop themselves started their careers by turning paint and plastic into literal silver, apparently, judging by the prices. Now, admittedly, the pickings will of course be slimmer out in the middle of nowhere compared to the heart of a hive city, but the presence of local law enforcement will also be a hell of a lot thinner, as by and large they're going to have much more important things to worry about than you knocking over a few buses and transports here and there and stealing their contents. And something that people often don't realise is that the cargo doesn't have to be something we normally perceive as out tried valuable for it to be worth stealing. Out on a world like the one we're talking about, and agricultural parts, little factories here and there, there are undoubtedly railways or even rolled transports carrying all kinds of raw materials, which can both be quite easy to sell and quite valuable. Allow me to um, give you a couple examples here from our time to illustrate the point. Norway is a um, pretty shit nation when it comes to railway infrastructure, but we did try to establish decent railways railway infrastructure in the southern part of the country around the capital of Oslo because, well, lots of goods and services are flowing through there every day and so it made sense. We built it like everybody else built it, which included vast quantities of copper in everything from the electrification to the signal boards to the railways to the little, little light posts, etc. Everything used copper in one way or another. Tens of thousands of tons of the stuff. And nobody thought twice about it, because, well, it's, it's just copper. In signals and lights and stuff, who's gonna care? <laughs> Lots of people were going to care. In fact, the railways were being stripped of the copper so frequently that we had to figure out substitute materials that weren't worth as much, because it turns out that copper is easy to break off from whatever it is attached to, easy to carry in bulk, and because it's used in goddamn everything, it's easy to sell in bulk as well. <laughs> The point being that you don't need to, um, you know, carry out jewellery heist or knock off gold transports to start earning a fair bit of money. Alternatively, if the stuff on board the trains is indeed valuable, well, all the better. Here's a second example. This picture here is uh, from the Los Angeles Times. There is an area in LA where the trains need to stop, and these are commercial freight trains carrying packages and goods from Amazon, UPS etc. stuff like that. People have started realizing that, well, there is a lot of money aboard these trains, and nobody is guarding them. All of those torn open boxes there? <laughs> those, are the, those are the transportation boxes, the Amazon boxes, the UPS boxes, all of those various things that are sold and sent all across the country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, um, it's a lucrative business, and hey, if nobody's gonna stop you, why not? And, most importantly, these crimes, while still being profitable, are fairly low profile. Which is vital if you're trying to create a successful chaos cult, as any kind of infamy that you build up in the early stages will come down to bite you later on. You're not trying to be a highway robber here, so you've got to take a bit more long-term concerns into consideration. Like, for example, if there is a clear and present history of you being a chaos cultist whilst robbing trains back in the day, the Inquisition is likely to react far more violently to rumours of you getting properly established. There is also the immediate risk factor that must be taken into account as well. Robbing a transport carrying 20 tons of grain is not as profitable as robbing a transport carrying 20 tons of gold, but you're likely to run into a hell of a lot less resistance in the former example, and to be honest, it'll probably be easier to sell the grain than the gold. 
Now, with finances firmly secured, hopefully at least, there is the possibility of expanding into less risque ways of earning a living. Once you've got a cash flow going, there is a few more hurdles to be jumped over, of course. The money needs to be laundered and cleaned so as to be used for more legalistic endeavours. These endeavours in and of themselves will also provide your merry band with ever more financial muscles. It might be more immediately profitable to be raiding stuff, but it's a lot safer and more long-term profitable to invest it in various businesses, particularly if you are on a planet with a great deal of unscrupulous businessmen. And hey, no matter where you are, you can always find a few of those bumbling about. It is now time to head into the recruitment phase of the operation, as you need to grow influence. You will certainly not be Midas at this point, but you should have enough to purchase a abandoned warehouse somewhere. Somewhere private and off the grid where the rest of the operations can be planned. Maybe start printing up um, some flyers to be distributed around the local population centres. Maybe purchasing a nice little minivan, mounting a speaker on it and start doing some rallies, things like this. Getting people interested in your message, which incidentally will also need crafting. On most Imperial worlds, there is an element of dissatisfaction with the local ruling forces. Hell, dissatisfaction with the government is hardly a rarity, nor is it unique to the 41st millennium. And once you start picking away at the foundation of society, I'm sure you can find a way or two in to that foundation by utilising grievances with, say food deliveries, the water situation, or if you're on a particularly well-off world, well, you can start inventing problems. They could potentially be fabricated from whole cloth, an impending alien invasion, or cultists in our midst. Do you know the signs to look out for? Blah blah blah, nonsense like that. Alternatively, you could also, depending upon your current power levels, create a bit of a crisis. There isn't a problem with food deliveries? Well, there wasn't one, until the food delivery started getting hijacked by those darn bandits. They are a threat to our peace, security and stability, I say, and the local governor is not doing enough to deal with this hazard. There are other approaches as well, which we mentioned in the cultist video. You might simply decide to become a religion. The imperial cult is broad and widespread, with many different local interpretations, and you might begin latching on to one of these. Maybe the god emperor is really a, a being, a luminescent warrior in golden armor, sat ensconced upon a throne with a bit more skulls than usual, mayhaps. Or maybe he takes on the image of a beatific, perfect man. The ideal human. The uh, ubermensch, if you will. Zealous sermons in and of themselves have proven to be a powerful tool in the 41st millennium time and time again. And if you combined them with a little bit of community outreach services, all the better. Maybe the local populace are not interested in hearing you rant on, but if you tell them that they will be waffles and hot cocoa delivered as well, hmm, suddenly it's a lot more interesting. <laughs> Perhaps on a, on a bit more of a grand scale, but you get the general drift of things. Once you've got your hook in, you then need to start to figure out how to organise them in such a way as to begin the conversion process, and potentially the breaking up into cells as well. Because at the end of the day, we are not satisfied with merely explaining to people that the Emperor is a damned handsome man that asks you to take particular delight in the waffles you are served, oh no no, we need to go a few steps further than that, you know, waffles one day, hedonistic drug parties with ritualistic gang rape the next, it's a, 
slippery slope, really. But there are some steps in between, and you need to figure out a good process to carry out those steps. If you jump directly from waffles to anal sex, you are likely to frighten a considerable portion of your prospective devotees. Maybe you start with simply slapping on a truly egregious quantity of strawberry jam onto the waffles. It may not sound like the direct equivalent of heroin, at least to begin with, but believe you me, after being at a LAN for about three or four days without sleep or any real solid sustenance, <laughs> it's... it is one hell of a drug. And you'll simply up the ante from there on out. Now, I mentioned safety mechanisms, and that's going to be very important as well. As you get deeper and deeper into the obscene arts of waffles, you will need to weed out those whose resolve is beginning to waver. And this is where we return to your criminal backstory, as it might be necessary to get some people to disappear, lest they begin suspecting the real nature of your friendly, friendly waffle house. Maybe this could take the form of a gradual introduction via, say, sponsors. So you have a bunch of people who have already proven their faith, or alternatively are so deeply involved in the machinery that there is no way out for them, and they take on a apprentice, whom they begin guiding through the process, grooming and taking care of, making sure that they are never overloaded, whilst also constantly packing on a little bit more, making it more and more difficult for them to actually get out of the life. You know, the uh, American gangster approach, essentially. You could also, uh, hearkening back to the criminal roots, get them involved in criminal activity. Life on most Imperial worlds tend to be rather harsh, and money difficult to come by. There is probably a... Uh, goodly number of people who would willingly sign up for a couple of low-risk heists with nobody getting injured to ensure they've got enough pocket money to feed their family and closest relatives. So one thing leads to another and suddenly a murder occurs. Oh jolly good god no! You were just in this to knock off some food here and there and now you're a wanted murderer? Well... Better stick close to your uh, friends and compatriots, because they're your only lifeline now. <laughs> no matter how depraved they might turn out to be. There are, of course, going to be the unavoidable goody-two-shoes that will refuse to bend no matter what. Hopefully, you'll have more guns than they will, and you'll be able to deal with them relatively quietly. Oh, oh yes, that, that person, he went away... away. Just away. You know, people travel and never come back. <laughs> Praying that local law enforcement once again are too busy with other things. You could also turn them into ingredients, as that's another point that we will be returning to shortly as well. But you might be thinking that most people would outright reject this. Most people would be the goody two-shoes, particularly in a society where the vast majority of the population have been indoctrinated into the imperial cult from, well... <laughs> the moment they were able to understand praise be the Emperor and read a holy book. However, if you've already been indoctrinated into one religion, what is there to stop you from being indoctrinated into another religion? If you're already willing to prescribe to the first religion's tenets, why not the second one? Religious conversions are hardly a rarity, after all, and even more so if the second religion is giving you some kind of tangible and immediate benefits. In the case of our Chaos Cult pretending to be a nice charitable organization, or offering you work, jobs, money, or charities, it gets a lot easier. Even more so if that cult is also pretending to be the thing that you originally worshipped, except they've got some slight variations in doctrine. Which get a bit more strident the deeper down you get, but the idea is that when you arrive at the point where you're starting to realize, oh shit, you're already in too deep to really start backpedaling. 
Now, once you've gotten the finances up and running, the recruiting, and the conversion, it's time to start talking about the really fun stuff, the actual uprising part of the uprising. Though we're not getting to open insurrection anytime soon, there are still several steps along the way. One of the most key is the organization of the various parts of the now, hopefully, growing cult. Assuming you began in some backwater town far away from the primary hive cities as a security measure, it's time to begin expanding. This could be done either by sending the, the little cult to other small settlements to begin you know, speaking the good word there. Or you could grow into a full-scale political party, assuming the world in question has some kind of an electoral system. Many imperial worlds do, many others do not. Though even if uh, there is no local electoral system, you could always uh, be the guy to champion for the creation of such a system, and labelling yourself a freedom fighter, a revolutionary if you will, though, well... If you are living on a tyrannical world, and odds are in the 41st millennium you probably are, then it is unfortunately unlikely that the local tyrant will look particularly kindly upon your efforts to introduce some form of self-serving democracy. In other words, this would be a very uh, risque approach, and would require a um, elevation in tension and hostilities a whole lot earlier than you might like. Assuming we're going with the more long-term infiltration approach, influence will have to be spread. And at this early point, you are probably also going to have to run the risk of having a centralized command structure, as it is far more important to continue growth in an organized and directed way, rather than trying to insulate yourself too much at this early stage. If you've got a good indoctrination process, you should be relatively safe. Though by the time you're moving into the big cities, the industrial strongholds, or the hive cities, you are probably going to want a far more compartmentalized structure. At the very least, within the inner circle. You need to separate the extremist activity almost entirely from the religious activity to make sure that one can't follow one thread to the other. Because if a group of obvious cultists are captured, and they are directly linked to this very large and growing religious institution, odds are that even the dimmest local constable will start putting two and two together and come knocking on your door with the riot police. And speaking of heavily armed special forces, with everything running smoothly, it's probably about time to start talking about armaments. And not just weapons, but all the various miscellaneous things that a budding revolutionary organization is going to require if it is to have any hope of actually launching a successful operation. And there are a couple things to be mentioned here. I mentioned them briefly in the Chaos Cultist video as well. Allies, both uh, real and corporeal, and immaterial. Let's begin with the immaterial ones, because this is a whole chapter in and of itself, really. How do you summon a goddamn demon? I don't know. I haven't the faintest goddamn clue, and I imagine that most Chaos Cultists probably don't either, as I quite fondly imagine that a not insubstantial number of prospective Chaos Uprisings have been thwarted not by the Imperium, but rather hungry hungry horrors summoned inexpertly by hobby level occultists, since getting the demon to appear is probably the easiest part, getting it to not instantly murder you and bathe in your innards the more difficult of the two. And gaining access to esoteric knowledge, like how to bind a plague bearer to your will, it's probably not the kind of stuff you're going to be getting at your local library anytime soon. This will necessitate expensive, extensive, and exceptionally risky operations. You will need to literally have entire teams of scholars working on this nonsense, and even then there will be a great deal of trial and error. Hell, 
Assuming you can somehow acquire a manuscript from Offworld or other cults maybe that have been around longer than you, how do you know that it actually works without testing it? And how do you test it without running the aforementioned risk of getting your own inside splattered across the wall in a festive painting? Hmm. Probably the easiest way to avoid having one's eyeballs used as cocktail dressing would be to organize very specialized cells, focused almost exclusively, if not indeed straight up exclusively, around the idea of demancy and or summoning. And preferably these cells would have no contact or knowledge at all about the main organization. In a perfect world, they should view themselves as the initial cult, as the people beginning, and they should think that all of this was their own idea. They just found a page of this ancient, weird, demonic book one day, and they decided to try it out, whilst the actual cultists are observing from a safe distance. On the off chance that they actually succeed, well, hippie! All you need to do now is copy their progress exactly. The uh, ways in which they lit the candles, what kind of candles, the way the room smelled, the way it looked, the songs they sung, etc, etc. And by doing this you can piece together the logic of summoning. Since all summoning works on a, well, fairly strict set of logical rules. The immaterium may be chaos, but it operates on very firm principles. The mortal world believes that something happens when you do this, therefore something will happen when you do this. Everything we do echo in the warp, and therefore a summoning ritual carried out precisely the way it is supposed to, will result in the expected events. Figuring out those events, figuring out those rules, what needs to happen when, in which direction, what order, what is and isn't important, etc, that is the difficult part. And more than likely, your first experimental cell will achieve nothing. Maybe they'll try once or twice, then get bored and go back to their lives and never think about any of this ever again. Maybe they will catastrophically fail and summon something highly unfortunate. Well, um, they often say that you can learn as much from failure as success, and there will certainly be lessons to be learned from such a thing. If you're lucky, it will brutally murder all of the hobbyists, and then simply disappear, having had its warp energy run out. If you're less fortunate, it will be able to sustain itself for long enough to make a proper ruckus in the neighborhood. And once the nosy old neighbor next door finds her favored kitten filleted, flayed, and fucked on her front porch, she's likely to ensure that local law enforcement take a decided interest in the matter. Best hope you were thorough in disposing of the evidence. But hey, you can't make an omelette without homiciding a few felines. So once the reing dies down, it is time to move on to the next bunch of involuntary volunteers and repeat proceedings until enough corpses have piled up high enough to form a functioning grimoire. And even that really is just the start. You now know how to summon something without it eating you immediately. And that's all well and good, but it doesn't get you very far. Summoning a blood letter isn't really going to help you much taking over a city. You need to summon a few thousand of those to really get the ball going. And even then, you need to find a way to expand the influence of the warp so that the demons can actually stay in the material world without poofing away embarrassingly in the middle of the uprising. However, summoning a demon is a vital first step, as demons can be tortured. <laughs> And that is a far swifter way of acquiring information than the uh, previous way, which is literally looking for old books and hoping and praying. Now there are more issues involved there because the ritual to summon a demon might not be the same as to summon another more valuable and useful demon and so on and so on and so on, but more research is required is pretty much the term there. 
Figuring out how to summon demonic allies is not easy. Figuring out how to summon the correct demonic allies in the right way and those who will be able to remain controllable are harder still. The word bearers have been doing this for 10,000 years and they still mess up more than half the time. Yet, the esoteric offers many other advantages as well. It's not all just demons and bloodletting, there are many other benefits that can be gained too, like communication for example. Unsurprisingly, Chaos Cultists are unlikely to possess their own astropaths, and are so going to need to carry out long range and secretive communication in uh, different ways. You might remember the warp flasks from the Horus Heresy, that's a rather brilliant one, speak into one creature and have it repeat the sentence another place. Massive range and completely untraceable. Kind of brilliant actually when you come to think of it and it shouldn't require that much power seeing as Erebus was able to pull it off that sniveling little shitbag. So that's one thing. Alternatively, spies and infiltrators. The warp could allow you to peek in on enemies without them having any way of knowing or that you were doing it. Scrying, perhaps even reading the future in its own limited fashion. Or sending various plagues and ales upon your political opposition. A particularly driven police officer getting a little bit too close to your secret hideout will make his penis fall off due to illness. That should distract the little bastard for a while, I imagine. And when political opposition suddenly falls ill and dies due to various viruses from the Far East, perhaps, no one can possibly blame you for it, right? <laughs> Yes, there are many benefits to learning how to control the powers of the Immaterium, though there are also many, many risks, which is again why a wise cult leader will leave the exploration of these esoterical arts up to other, more expendable individuals, and then contend themselves to harvesting the spoils of others' sacrifice and progress at a later date. But beyond the esoterical, there are other things required as well. Now that our cult has grown quite large, it has in place a solid fundament of both financial or recruitment and conversions, along with the potential to use the esoteric arts. We need to look into other forms of armaments, literal armaments in this case. And this is where we hit a little bit of a speed bump. Weapons have throughout history been recognized as one of the key resources necessary for any kind of large-scale and truly effective civil disobedience. As such, all rulers have sought to control the flow of weaponry. Obviously, the 41st millennium is no exception to this, and military-grade weapons like las guns, etc. are heavily guarded and controlled. The civilian populace, and most of the PDF really, only have access to old and outdated pieces. Usually things like solid slug weaponry a la auto guns. Little more than, well, automatic rifles, not too dissimilar from what we are using today, really. And when it comes to heavier pieces, like heavy bolters, auto cannons, rocket launchers, mortars, etc., these things would still be considered relative small or squad support weapons in the Imperial Guard, but they are almost unheard of in the PDF. And if they do exist, they will be focused into specialized units, heavy weapons teams and specialized elite platoons, part of the standing army. Alternatively, some of the heavy weaponry would also be located potentially amongst the local law enforcement. If there is, for example, a major Adeptus Arbites presence, unlikely on a small world like this, then they would have quite a bit of heavy weaponry, including APCs. Now, the Hive City might also have special riot units, not Arbites, mind you, but local law enforcement equipped with heavier gear, but once more, in extraordinarily limited quantities. So getting a hold of weaponry will not be at all easy. One of the easiest quote unquote ways would be to improvise various explosive devices since making something go boom is, well, 
not that hard, really. Particularly when compared to making, oh, a few hundred thousand assault rifles, along with artillery, etc. Indeed, explosives can be found almost anywhere if you know what to look for. Completely harmless nonsense used in farming can make quite the explosion if properly treated. Several industrial goods can be rather volatile as well. And since this world we are talking about has a bit of a mix of everything, access to explosives will definitely be there in some way, shape or form. But yeah, they're not exactly uh, subtle, nor are they particularly versatile either, so guns will be required. Already we've talked about the criminal past of our little gang, and getting a hold of a dozen or two weapons is probably not an impossibility, even for the average citizen. But to arm a proper uprising, you're gonna need more than a half a dozen hunting shotguns. In fact, it might be to the point where you either need the ability to produce your own weapons, very difficult considering the sheer quantity of raw resources and technical skill as well, unless you're willing to settle for some really, really shitty guns. Or you will need access to large stockpiles of weapons. It's not like robbing a, a gun store would help you here either. Even robbing a few dozen gun stores would maybe get you enough weapons to equip, what, a hundred fighters? Two hundred if you're lucky? No. You're gonna have to go on a whole different scale than that. Which is where allies might finally come into the picture as well. In all due likelihood, you're not the only group of people that is uh, dissatisfied with local governance. There might even be other straight-up chaos cults operating on the planet. A wise cult will reach out and establish a network of these different factions, and use them as expendable pawns, obviously. Promising them a seat once you finally get in power, whilst making sure that, uh, whilst they might be seats, the cushions will all be replaced with bear traps. Cause, you know, they're chaos cultists. They're probably lunatics, have you seen those cornered crazies? God. No, 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 you don't want them in power, trust me. But even chaff has its uses, and if you're exceedingly lucky, you might even get contact with allies from the outside, though this is very unlikely. The peculiar nature of 40k long-range communication, astropaths, means that you're gonna need highly trained and skilled individuals to communicate over those kinds of distances. Furthermore, astropathic activity of that level might be noticed. It would be uh, highly risque. But on the topic of allies, there are of course many other kinds of allies as well, some that would be far more valuable in other ways. We mentioned this too in the Chaos Cultist video, that the um, smarter, subtler, more patient cults might spend a great deal of time convincing local luminaries to support their cause, either knowingly or unknowingly, because this grants a great deal of potential power. If you can get your organization to be publicly accepted as either a new religious direction, a version of the imperial cult, or simply a local philanthropic movement, or hell, even a full-blown political party, assuming the planet has that kind of system, that will open a great deal of new doors. Because whilst knocking over a, a couple dozen gun stores aren't going to get you all that much in the way of weaponry, raiding the local planetary arsenals with the doors unlocked by their regimental commanders, that is going to help out quite a bit. Getting to that point, though, is a very, very, very long road indeed. We're talking decades at the very least, probably centuries, for that level of infiltration. And it gets even harder to hide it. If a hundred thousand rifles disappears, you better bet somebody's gonna notice. You better be ready for that uprising, otherwise shit's gonna get damned hot awfully quickly. It would be better to simply have things disappear. Even during peacetime, militaries go through equipment like nobody's goddamn business. Shit breaks constantly, all the time, everywhere, and requires routine replacements. Weapon? 
break. Ammunition is expended. Mines are exploded. Heavy weapons rounds are fired. All of these things are a running expenditure. What if every third heavy bolter shell isn't actually fired, but set aside? What if one in five rifles isn't actually broken, but simply listed as such? Keep doing this for long enough, and you'll have yourself a pretty mighty arsenal with none the wiser as to what happened with all of this excess ammunition and weaponry. Of course, hiding it eventually becomes a problem, but hey, at this point, the cult should be in possession of multiple large-scale locations, possibly even warehouses or massive underground hidey holes. Ah, yes. The ultimate lair of any true supervillain. A base located beneath a mountain. Stalactites or pigmatites or whatever those things hanging in the ceiling are called. Dripping water down. Which sounds like a... Honestly, a health hazard. It would breed mold like crazy, so maybe not that part. But secret base, at the very least, absolutely one of those, with vast underground armories. Maybe you could even steal some armored vehicles and anti-tank weapons. That'd be particularly useful if the local PDF is armed to the teeth. On the other hand, though, if you're reaching that level of influence, the PDF might be allies rather than opponents. And there's another ally as well. If you can convince enough local commanders, you don't even need to necessarily convince their men. If a regimental commander gives the order for a regiment to deploy in a particular area, are they gonna not do it? <laughs> they don't know what their commander is up to. There was um, a recent incident in this in um, in Turkey, I think, in one of the failed coups where a bunch of military were deployed to a bridge and they had no idea why they were there. They were just ordered to sortie and go to the bridge and that was it. They didn't know anything more than that. A great deal of chaos could undoubtedly be spread, particularly also if you make sure to inform them there are dangerous chaos cultists around. Uh, over there, mind you, not <laughs> not over there. Those those are harmless civilians, you see. Hmm, absolutely. And speaking of civilians, there are a couple other things that will be required too. Guns are neat and all, and undeniably necessary, but the civilian population will prove more of a hindrance than anything unless food and water and shelter is also all secured. Because here's the thing, a chaos uprising will create a great deal of, well, Chaos. But assuming you can't expect any outside support, you are launching this with the intent of taking over the planet itself. Now, this isn't the only type of Chaos Uprising. Again, as I mentioned in the uh, Chaos Cultists video, many of these uprisings are organized specifically by an outside force, which will then raid the planet, bring aboard the cultists, those lucky enough to still be alive and are, you know, valuable enough to be rescued anyways, and then they will simply leave the planet. But that's far more of a smash and grab operation, and really, Beyond stockpiling enough guns for a day or two of rampaging, you don't really need all that much. But if we are intending to actually seize the entire planet, there are a lot more issues that need to be considered. No matter what, your uprising is only going to be a tiny fraction of the overall population. Because well, if you keep going for long enough, there's gonna be idiots. There's going to be a lot of idiots, and the more idiots you bring into your organization, the greater the risk of one of the idiots doing something idiotic and getting themselves, and possibly several other groupings also, exposed to imperial scrutiny. And it really only takes one big fuck up for the Imperium's watchdogs to get involved. Once an Inquisitor begins sniffing around, you're pretty much out of time, and you've got a week or two at most to get things going, and you better make it swift when it does happen. But to return to the point of the civilian populace, most of them are not going to be on your side, but 
happily, most of them are not going to be on the opposition's side either. As in a civil war like this, the civilian populace are just a bunch of mad sheeps running around the fire lines. They're not going to take up arms and fight for the emperor in all due likelihood. They don't have the training nor probably the motivation to do so. The overwhelming majority of them will go to the temple, they'll worship, they'll do their everyday live things, but they're not going to turn into a blood mad and berserk zealots once the bullets start flying. Most of them will probably panic. At best, they'll hide in their houses and not bother either side. At worst, they'll go crazy, beginning to loot, smash things up, or rampage through the streets, seeing an opportunity to gain a little bit for themselves. And there is an inherent danger in that sort of behavior, too. Let's say that the cult does manage to seize an area. They've now got control of a, a village or maybe even an entire hive city. But they haven't thought on how to feed the population. They might not have been your outright enemies to begin with, but after a week or so without food, and they're sure as hell going to be your enemies then. To further complicate matters, whilst you can certainly store up enough provisions for your own fighters without too much in the way of worry, storing enough food to feed a major civilian population centre is quite the different problem. People eat a lot of food, and they drink a lot of water, and you need a heaping whole hell of a lot of both. The kind of quantities that you're not going to be um, squirreling away in secret, meaning that it's going to be necessary to cease control over these vital pieces of infrastructure in the opening hours, preferably, or at the very latest days of an insurrection, both to make sure that you've got enough food and water for your own troops, and also to pacify the civilian population. Now, there's also an alternative approach, which I'm sure many of you are already shouting, namely that chaos should be chaotic. Why do you care if the populace is starving? In fact, all the better. They'll be driven mad. They'll start robbing one another, shooting one another, murdering one another, eating one another. Surely this would create the perfect circumstances for a bunch of immaterial allies to show up, right? And you're entirely correct. Yet again, though, we are somewhat constrained by the, uh, the narrative we've got going here. If you truly want control over the planet, you've got to limit the amount of damage you do to it to a certain degree, especially if you want to survive the near-inevitable Imperial counterattack. Of course, if you're a blood-maddened, cornered cult, then simply drowning the entire planet in a wave of blood is exactly what you're after. Though, this is one of the things that have always annoyed me a little bit about 40k as well. I remember reading some stories about entire hive cities succumbing to absolute madness, panic, and chaos. We're talking billions of people driven insane and the Imperium then has to arrive months later to clean it up. How are there still people alive months later? Much less blood-maddened berserkers. Do they stop being blood-maddened berserkers every now and then to secure their food supplies? How do they survive in a hive city? Are they living off the supplies that were already there? I mean, that's feasible. But would they have the wherewithal to keep it contained? To not waste all of it? To accurately ration it, etc. If you think about it, the purely chaotic Chaos Uprising could be dealt with very, very easily. Cordon off the affected area and wait. If they're Chaos Crazies, they'll run out of food and water long before you have to worry about actually shooting them. But the really dangerous kind of chaos is the kind of chaos that is chaotic and yet also simultaneously ordered. The Sabbath World Crusade series, or the Gaunt's Ghost book series to be more precise, did a fantastic job of illustrating and showing a lot of this off. There was 
one book in particular, I can't remember the title, but Gaunt and a group of his ghosts were infiltrated onto a chaos held world, and it gave us a very interesting little look as to how such a planet would function. Now, this was held by the infamous Blood Pact, which I'll have to do a video on about at some point, which are far more disciplined than most Chaos armies. And life for the regular populace went on more or less as usual, with far stricter uh, security measures, absolutely, and with a great deal of uh, yeah, additional inconveniences, shall we say, like demons stalking the forests and shit, but the populace was still expected to harvest the grain. They were still expected to process it into flour. They were still expected to turn that again into bread. They were still expected to have a civilian infrastructure and an economy running, because otherwise the armies of chaos could not operate. Because the simple truth is, a chaos cultist needs food just as much as an imperial guardsman does. This means that when it comes to actually planning the uprising itself, at long last we arrive at the, uh, the heart of the matter, logistical and infrastructure targets must receive equal if not greater attention and importance than the military ones. And again, we're making the assumption here that we are one of the smart Chaos cults, one of those that eventually spirals out into a little Chaos empire. Because those do exist, there are entire solar systems, and even small groupings of solar systems, ruled by Chaos. And when I say ruled, I do mean ruled, as in they are run like states, like nations, like countries, like organized groupings, rather than simply maddened hellholes. Those do exist as well. There are chaos-held feral worlds, for example, that are little more than large conglomerates of cavemen beating each other over the head with ever more blunted objects, but again. We have, as I said, made a fair few assumptions about the nature of our cult. Obviously, this does not mean that military targets can be entirely ignored. Assuming that you can't bring the entirety of the PDF over onto your side, which is likely, there is uh, going to be a whole lot of diehards, uh, actual genuine believers, and patriotic individuals within the PDF. This is basically unavoidable. So you're going to have to kill some of them. This will be made a lot easier if you can identify those diehard individuals ahead of time, once more requiring a proper infiltration of the Imperial military machinery on the planet. In the case of a PDF, this should be relatively simple, as they are essentially weekend warriors, national guard types. There's probably quite the revolving door in their upper echelons heading into politics, for example. If you're lucky, you might even be on a planet where the political body has some sort of influence over the running of the PDF or whatever local military forces are in place, meaning that you could ensure that particularly stubborn regiments are placed under the command of particularly pliant and or incompetent commanders. As for the priorities between military and civilian targets, well, it all depends upon the scale and the organization of the uprising. Ideally, you would want to gather up whatever loyalist forces you are absolutely sure will remain loyal into cordoned off areas, pre-set up killing zones, if you will, and then surrounding them by other regiments you know will not stay quite so loyal. A bit of a Battle of Calths scenario, where as many Imperial troops can be slaughtered in the opening minutes as possible. If you don't have enough troops for that, you should simply aim to isolate whatever high-value military targets are available and concentrate on crushing them first and foremost, particularly driven or elite regiments, or potentially even just the commanders. Again, if you are so lucky as to be on a planet where the civilian administration has some power over the military, far from guaranteed, mind you, then you could gather all of the commanders to a dinner somewhere and then place a very large explosive device underneath the dinner table. That should uh, cause some confusion in the upper echelons, I think. 
You could also target infrastructure. It might not be as effective immediately as outright attacking the military, but either seizing control over or simply just destroying uh, bridges or roads or railway lines will severely hamper the enemy's ability to mobilize and actually become a threat to your uprising. It doesn't matter if there's a massive elite Imperial Guard regiment on the planet if they can't go anywhere. Control over vitally important bridges, roads, and choke points will also grant easy access to the other infrastructure targets, water treatment plants, grain silos, food industry, all of these useful things. And the starport. Now, the starport is not as high priority a target as you might think, because Reinforcements are not going to be arriving from the outside any time soon. Even assuming that the Imperial commander sends off an SOS signal the moment your uprising begins, it is going to take weeks for the message to get anywhere, weeks more for it to be acted upon, and yet further weeks for a response force to be gathered and dispatched to the theatre. Despite this, though, the starport is a target of absolute strategic importance that must be seized as soon as the more immediately pressing objectives have been taken. The last thing you want is for a bunch of zealous PDF troopers to get nice and dug down around the starport. If you can't shift them before the reinforcements arrive, then your uprising is probably in for a premature end. To avoid this, coordination, timing, and planning will be very important. Presuming you will have a limited number of men at your disposal, pretty much guaranteed, you need to find a way to strike as many of the top priorities targets as simultaneously as possible. You want to win the war before the enemy is aware that they are fighting one. The starport would be one of those luxury objectives. If it could be taken before the defenders are aware of its value, so much the better. But at the same time, the starport offers absolutely no immediate advantage at all. Beyond access to whatever ships are stationed there, I suppose, but unless you know you have allies coming from the outside and in, the ability to land starships <laughs> doesn't really benefit you much, unless you're somehow planning to spread the revolution, the revolt, the uprising to other areas that also have starports that you can also seize simultaneously. But even then, all you're doing is splitting your forces and transporting them back and forth quickly. There is, there is very little immediate advantage in seizing the starport. Now, in many cases, though, the starports will also be large hubs for storage. And many worlds will be importing a lot of their food, a lot of their resources, maybe even a lot of their water from outside sources. In these cases, there might be enormous armored silos, which allows you to kill two birds with one stone. As for how exactly these strategic areas would be seized quickly, well, infiltration would be your best option. Assuming the planet has no idea what's coming, weapons could be hidden in various locations inside of the strategic objectives, to be picked up by loyal men when the time is right. Doing this, even strategic command centers could be seized from the inside very quickly, after which doors and blast doors, hatches, etc. could be opened for additional allies to stream in. Though, let's be honest here, it's unlikely everything has gone quite so swimmingly up until this point. You might have been discovered, the planet might have some inkling as to what's going on, local law enforcement might be moving, maybe the PDF is already on high guard. If possible, the storm should be allowed to die down, but it might not always be an option to wait it all out. In which case, a full-scale military escalade might be required, but if you're ever required to pit simple chaos cultists up against even PDF troops, 
Well, let's hope you've got a pretty hefty numerical advantage, which, to be fair, you may very well do. Most Imperial worlds have a very small PDF garrison. It's intended to see off um, relatively small-scale incursions, raiding forces of a few thousand strong. And so if the PDF were to be charged by a hundred thousand knife-wielding religious lunatics, they'd probably crumple quite quickly. At least so long as the cultists have the advantage of surprise. That too is one of those vital terms. For at the very least the first few hours, the Chaos Uprising is likely to have shock and surprise on its side, and never underestimate the value of shock. It can make even the most seasoned military personnel do very, very stupid things and it can completely paralyze your opposition from doing anything for extended periods of time. Let me give you yet another example from our real world history. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, another US airfield, this time on the Philippines, was hit by Japanese primarily land-based bombers. This was four hours after the news of Pearl Harbor had been, you know, released to military personnel. They knew that Pearl Harbor had been struck, and yet when the Japanese bombers appeared above Clark's Field, all of the US aircraft were still lined up in perfect parade formation. Because the reality of it just hadn't sunk in yet. And so if a Chaos Cult actually manages to make it to this point, odds are the Uprising will be a smashing success, and will overrun the PDF fairly easily. As to whether or not they'll be able to maintain control over the planet, that is an entirely different problem. Because then, of course, begins the process of administration. Well, at least our Chaos leaders have had some experience in running organizations previously, for a few decades now, so maybe they'll tackle this well too, but this is where our video ends, and where most Chaos cults end too, as they realize they are not able to maintain any real degree of control. The various factions will begin infighting, and their once unifying goals of overthrowing the planet will now all be not. They've done it. What's next? What are they going to do? Are they going to fight the Imperium? Are they going to try and escape? Are they going to seek outside allies? Are they going to try to become demon princes, one and all? That is where Chaos's Achilles heel have always been located. They tend to scatter and shatter awfully quickly without a powerful overriding force. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening. I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.